The year is 1973. The United States had just left Vietnam, the Sydney Opera House was months away from opening, and a man named Jan Erik Olsen entered the Nordmomstorg Square Credit Banken in Stockholm, Sweden. Olsen was a convicted criminal on leave from prison when he took four employees hostage and attempted to rob the bank. Over the course of the next six days, Olsen would make demands, threaten to kill his hostages, and wounded several police officers before finally being apprehended. While on the surface there was nothing remarkable about this course of events, the aftermath revealed something a bit more peculiar. After being released, all of the hostages refused to testify against Olsen. More than this, they actively raised money to fund his defense in court. This incongruent response baffled police and psychologists alike, leading to research into the development of positive feelings for a captor by a hostage, better known as Stockholm Syndrome. For every game that is perfectly designed to be speedrun, countless others don't meet the standard. Whether it's bad movement, flawed mechanics, or any number of defects, some games make bad speedruns. There's a specific type of game that goes beyond this point though. A tier that progresses simply being bad and instead it becomes outright antagonistic. <gasps> no way! He's playing the fan. No! I just got exodiated! <laughs> Yet, despite some games clearly hating speedrunning, they often still have runners. But before we get started, you know what else people hate? When YouTubers stop and do a whole long wind up trying to convince you to subscribe. That's why I kept this quick, almost as quick as hitting that subscribe button. The earliest days of gaming brought about many infamous titles, but none occupy quite the same place as Takeshi no Chosenjo, or Takeshi's Challenge. The game was designed by Takeshi Kitano, best known for his show Takeshi's Castle. The show featured contestants competing in a series of physical challenges, resulting in the survivors confronting Takeshi himself in hopes of conquering his castle. The influence of the show can still be seen to this day, with popular series like Ninja Warrior and Wipeout incorporating similar elements. Takeshi would prove to be a trendsetter in far more ways than just this though. In 1986, he became the first Japanese celebrity to contribute to the creation of a video game, leading to the development of Takeshi's Challenge. The game perfectly fit into the rest of Takeshi's portfolio, in that it was nothing short of absurd, featuring bizarre game mechanics and excessive difficulty. The game follows the life of a Japanese salaryman who sets off in search of lost treasure. The best example of the perplexing nature of the game comes near the beginning. As is common for salarymen, the player enters a bar to sing karaoke. At this point, the player is expected to actually sing the song, using the microphone that was built into some of the Famicom controllers. Once done with the song, he's attacked by several people, including an old man who must be beaten up in order to finish the game. If the player does not kill the old man, he'll actually kill the player once they reach the treasure and claim it for himself. To this day, it's considered one of the worst games ever made. Being a bad game doesn't necessarily mean it'll be a bad speedrun though. Many of the greatest speedruns come from titles that are mediocre at best. For a normal run of Takeshi's Challenge, it proves to be a perfectly serviceable game. The player still needs to sing karaoke and beat up the old man, but then is able to clip through a wall and traverse directly to where the treasure is. Where it becomes clear that this game has a disdain for speedrunners is in another category. Besides any percent and 100%, one of the next most common categories for speedrunning is known as low percent. Low percent is a universal speedrunning term that refers to beating a game as quickly as you can, but with as little of the game completed as possible. This results in a slower run overall, but usually requires creative solutions to make up for the lack of tools at the runner's disposal. While most of the items in Takeshi's Challenge are skipped in any percent, runners still need to collect the map that leads them to the treasure. This is the reason singing karaoke is necessary, as the old man is the one who gives it to you. This too can be skipped, but the method is less than ideal. The game's starting screen has the player select options by controlling the salary man. In this state, the player is still able to punch. This is where things fall apart, as this leads to one of the most repetitive easter eggs ever. Commonly referred to as simply 20,000 punches, this surprisingly enough underestimates the target. In actuality, the easter egg takes 30,720 punches, at which point the player is warped to the last level of the game. To put into perspective how tedious this is, a punch can be done every 4 frames. At 60 frames per second, this would be 15 clicks. This is certainly fast, but still relatively achievable. The bigger issue is how long it takes. At one punch every 4 frames, 30,720 punches would take 122,880 frames, or just over 34 minutes of clicking a single button. 
in a task created of this category, the run came in at 34 minutes 21 seconds. Of that time, all but 13 seconds were spent mashing, with the rest being walking to the left to collect the treasure. To further underline the disdain Takeshi's challenge shows to speedrunners, if the player waits after collecting the treasure for long enough, a text box opens that asks a question every speedrunner has heard countless times. Why do you take this game so serious? This is hardly the last time a game would be self-aware to the detriment of speedrunners. In the case of South Park The Fractured But Whole, this becomes apparent from the beginning. Like many games, there's an intro cutscene. While the player is given the option to skip, this is just an illusion. Holding the button will not skip the cutscene, but instead, by repeatedly trying to, Cartman will get annoyed at the player, sending them straight to the credits. This means that for every attempt by a runner, they need to sit through the cutscene before they can start playing. Shortly after the run begins, the game presents the player with another instance of disdain. Normally, speedrunners benefit from having certain aspects of a game memorized, allowing them to complete tasks without doing the prerequisites normally expected. In order to enter Cartman's basement, the player needs to input a password to unlock the door. This password is the same every playthrough, so every speedrunner would know it without needing a check. When inputting the password though, Cartman pops up onto the screen dressed as the New England Patriots coach Bill Belichick and berates the player for cheating. He'll continue to do this each time the password is input, until the player goes up to Cartman's room and finds the paper with the code written down. This isn't even a one-off gag. Later on in the game, a password is needed to enter the back room of a church. Just like for Cartman's basement, if the player does not find the code legitimately, Cartman will dress up as Belichick, call the player Tom Brady, and they will be unable to progress. Other aspects that show the game's disdain for speedrunning can be seen best when compared to the game's prequel, The Stick of Truth. Like many modern games, a fast travel system was implemented so the player can avoid pointless wandering to reach a part of the map they've already traveled to. While the application to speedrunning is obvious, the drawbacks that the fractured butthole faces can only really be seen when comparing the two games. In both, the player needs to make their way to the designated fast travel locations before they can warp. Once there though, the process is significantly faster in the stick of truth. This is due to a cutscene that the fractured butthole added. Every time the player fast travels, they have to watch Jimmy walk up to them, the act of him warping the player, and then him walking off screen. In total, the fractured butthole adds 9 seconds of cutscenes every time the player fast travels, which didn't exist previously. While this may seem insignificant, this builds up over the course of the run. Especially in longer categories, each fast travel losing 9 seconds can amount to minutes of unavoidable time loss. The single biggest way speedrunning was impeded though was through the patching of glitches. When the game was new, a trick existed where the player would collect XP, save and reload the game, and be able to recollect the same XP. This allowed for characters to be quickly leveled up, speeding up the early portions of the game in particular due to being overpowered. Eventually though, the glitch stopped working, but not in the usual way. Normally, when a trick gets removed, the developers release an updated patch. While this can be annoying, speedrunners can typically play an earlier version of the game and continue using the trick on a version where it still works. In the case of the fractured but whole though, this isn't an option. Instead, one day, the glitch just stopped working. There was no update that the developers pushed, so runners couldn't fall back on a previous version as the trick no longer worked on any of them. The trick was seemingly removed from existence with hardly an explanation. The best bet as to why this glitch stopped working comes from outside of the game. The game required the Uplay launcher to play, which is necessary for all Ubisoft titles. In October of 2020, Uplay would be rebranded to Ubisoft Connect, and with that, the trick stopped working. While it's unknown what about this change would have removed the XP glitch, it's the only lead the community has to go off of. While some games have their speedrunning scenes ruined by the choices of the developers, others merely face unfortunate inconveniences. By all accounts, Super Mario Bros. 1 is an incredible and iconic speedrun with one of the most storied histories in all of gaming. That said, some quirks exist that make the speedrun more peculiar. The most well known of these is the frame rule. In order to optimize performance, the game only checks to see if Mario has finished a level every 21 frames. This means that, with the exception of the last level, time can only be saved or lost in 21 frame increments as the level will only transition at these intervals. While frame rules largely define Super Mario Bros. speedrunning, they aren't the only thing that need to be factored when finishing a level. Another seemingly insignificant feature that developers included play a role. When Mario reaches a flagpole, it's possible that fireworks will go off to celebrate his achievement. 
This occurs when Mario touches the flag, and the last number of the timer is either a 1, a 3, or a 6, with the number of fireworks going off corresponding with the number in the timer. Now, getting one firework is fine, as it doesn't lose time to zero fireworks, since it plays while the flag is being raised over the castle. In fact, in Warpless runs, levels 4, 3, and 6, 1 both are completed with a 1 on the timer. 3 and 6 fireworks are a different story though. Since each firework is launched individually, and since the flag raising animation is so short, every additional firework loses time. This means that sometimes, although it may be possible to reach the end of a level faster, doing so would end the level with a 3 or a 6 on the timer. In these situations, the player has to purposefully slow down so that the timer flips down to a 2 or a 5, losing some time during the level, but saving back more by avoiding fireworks. While waiting for a clock to tick down a second may seem slow, it's not as bad as it seems. While the timer starts by saying 400, this isn't actually 400 seconds. Instead, players have 160 seconds to complete most levels, each tick of the timer being equal to 24 frames, or 0.4 seconds. This means that, depending on how long the player needs to wait and how frame rules align, slowing down may not lose any time in level, as Mario will still meet the same frame rule that going full speed reaches. All this comes to play in a normal any% percent run. Any% percent is made up of 8 levels. Since fireworks only launch after Mario touches a flagpole, 3 of these levels can be immediately disregarded, with these levels being 1-2, 4-2, and 8-4. 1-2 and 4-2 both feature warp pipes, so rather than raising the flag, the level ends with Mario teleporting to a later level. 8-4 on the other hand is the castle. Rather than flagpoles, castle levels end when Mario touches the axe. This leaves the 5 remaining levels in the route. 1-1 one, one is completed with 369 left on the timer, 4-1 with 340, 8-1 ends on a flat 200, while 8-2 touches the flagpole at 338. With none of these levels particularly close to launching fireworks, all that's left is 8-3. Here, runners approach the flagpole on pace for a 243, and the subsequent 3 fireworks that accompany it. To combat this, players slow down on the stairs just long enough for the timer to tick. For runners at the top level though, they also need to set up a flagpole glitch while slowing down. This sees them needing to release moving for a specific number of frames, slowing them down enough that the timer ticks, but also setting up their subpixels to clip into the block of the flagpole. As is often the case, SMB1 is unique. This weird feature doesn't serve as a drawback, but rather adds another layer to what players need to consider. Other Nintendo titles aren't as lucky. It often goes underappreciated just how unlikely speedrunning tricks are. Games need to be broken in just the right way for the run to work. This is true at every scale of a run. For instance, Lackey to Skip in Super Mario 64 is a trick that maybe people take for granted. Casual viewers may not even realize that anything out of the ordinary is occurring, but being able to skip Lackey to is purely a matter of coincidence. Had the developers just made the trigger slightly bigger, the game would be 8 seconds slower. This concept of just the right amount of breaking only applies more as the tricks become more complex. As it currently stands, runners have beaten SM64 without collecting a single star. All that's still needed is the key to unlock the basement given after beating Bowser in the Dark World, and the key going upstairs from Bowser in the Fire Sea. Tass manages to strike this down to just the second key leading upstairs. In order for this to work, a whole host of things have to fall in line perfectly. The most pressing issue is that there needed to be a way to enter the basement without first beating Bowser. While the developers failed to include an alternate entrance upstairs, there's a door at the bottom of the moat. Questionable architecture aside, the fact that there is both a door accessible without the first key and that this door works from the very beginning of the game is nothing short of luck. Had there been no door at the bottom of the moat, the key from Dark World would need to be collected. It's these small decisions of game design that end up truly defining speedrunning. SM64 was lucky. That door could just as easily be coded to not open until after the moat was drained. This is a fundamental decision that developers are constantly faced with. When something exists that players aren't supposed to reach until later, do you leave it active or not? For a lot of developers, if they truly think the player will never reach something, they'll do nothing. For instance, in Spyro, the developers left the world triggers active, but simply moved them below the map. While this made it hard to reach though, it still was possible. When a developer disables the trigger though, possible becomes impossible. This is the case for Luigi's Mansion 3. The game is largely linear, with Luigi navigating his way through a hotel. The game centers around the hotel's elevator, which allows Luigi to travel between floors. The game's main collectible are the elevator's buttons, which each allows Luigi to travel to a new floor. Most of the buttons are collected by defeating the boss on another floor, but there are a few exceptions. 
On the seventh floor, Garden Suites, the button is inside a giant Venus flytrap that Luigi needs to climb to the top of. This floor is largely vertical in its design, necessitating Luigi travel up many flights of stairs and tackle a scattering of rooms on his way to the top. Once there, Luigi has to pry open the plant's jaw to get to the button. Especially since the plant is so tall, it would make sense for the developers to assume that in order to reach the top, the players had to traverse their way to the top as expected. If this were the case, the player would be able to open the Venus Flytrap's mouth as soon as they reach the top. As luck would have it though, it is possible to reach the top using glitches. By using the vacuum as Luigi, then spawning Gooigi, it's possible to displace Luigi through walls or into the air by having Gooigi flash him and then walk into him. By utilizing this technique known as Gooigi pushing, the player can navigate all the way to the top of the plant without having to go through the ghost filled rooms. Once up there, Luigi can open the plant up and the button flies out. Unfortunately, this is where the good luck ends. Normally, once the plant is opened, a cutscene plays where Luigi fails to catch the button and it subsequently rolls down to the floor below. Here though, no such cutscene plays. As it would turn out, these seemingly innocuous rooms are secretly mandatory triggers that the player needs to pass through in order to activate certain flags. Without passing through these flags, the game refuses to progress and play the cutscene. This wasn't a one-off circumstance either. The 8th floor of the hotel functions as a variety of movie sets, with Luigi needing to go between the sets in order to get the director's megaphone. This typically involves recording Guigi doing several tasks, including obtaining a torch, lighting the torch on fire, and then burning a spider's web to reach the megaphone. Upon giving the megaphone to the director, he opens a door immediately in front of him that leads to the boss fight. More than anything, Floor 8 demonstrates the inconsistencies that the developers had when determining triggers. Here, it's possible to obtain the torch without ever going into the camera, meaning that a typically necessary event can be skipped. Despite this, if the player clips into the room where the boss is, the boss battle does not begin. For other games, the issues aren't the result of many tiny problems, but instead happen because of a few glaring ones that are impossible to ignore. SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom is by and large a good speedrun. Most categories are broken up into three overarching segments, the early game, the middle game, and the end game. In early game, SpongeBob is at his most basic moveset. This part of the run focuses primarily on deactivating the game's out-of-bounds detection to sequence break to parts of the game that are supposed to be reserved for much later. By disabling out-of-bounds detection, SpongeBob is able to cross from one section of the hub world over an invisible wall by storing vertical momentum from one level through a menu and jumping on the first frame the game loads in. By being able to access later collectibles early, SpongeBob can fight the game's first boss and enter the middle game. Beating this boss gives SpongeBob the bowling ball attack. Much like how jumping can be used to displace vertical momentum, the bowling ball does the same horizontally. This causes SpongeBob to move incredibly quickly, allowing him to cross huge gaps by using only simple level geometry. By using the game's out of bounds detection, the displacement is even larger, with it being possible to cross an entire level in an instant. More importantly though, the bowling ball allows for SpongeBob to generate an infinite amount of money. By making use of the ski ball machine on the Gulagoon Pier, SpongeBob can wedge the bowl in a stone tiki. This causes it to displace, activating a trigger every other frame. These shinies can be used to buy 8 spatulas for Mr. Krabs. All in, the bowl greatly speeds up the run. The first 15 spatulas needed to reach the first boss takes approximately 11 minutes, while the 24 needed to reach the second boss takes less than 9. It's after the second boss that the run becomes truly unrecognizable though. Admittedly, the rocket attack is virtually never used in speedruns, but one oversight by the developers allowed this ability to be much, much more game-breaking. By activating the bowl and the rocket at the same time, the model change caused by the rocket interrupts the bowl, preserving the forward momentum that the bowl provides. This can be used to greatly increase SpongeBob's momentum speed, with the rest of the game rarely being played at anything less than twice as fast, and some segments have SpongeBob running at over 10 times his normal movement speed. This results in the final 36 spatulas being collected in just around 14 minutes. The only issue is the two bosses that need to be beaten in order to get these powers. The first boss, Robo Sandy, takes around 200 seconds to beat, while the second boss, Robo Patrick, takes over 4 minutes. Just these two spatulas take nearly 7.5 minutes or nearly 20% of the total runtime. While it's normal for speedruns to have faster and slower parts, these two bosses are especially egregious when taken in context of the game as a whole. In total, there are three main bosses. The previously mentioned Robo Sandy and Patrick, as well as Robo Spongebob, and three mini-bosses. The King Jellyfish, Prawn, and the Flying Dutchman. 
Another way to group these bosses is Prawn, the Flying Dutchman, and Robo Spongebob in one group, with King Jellyfish, Robo Sandy, and Robo Patrick being the other. In each of Prawn, the Flying Dutchman, and Robo Spongebob, the developers left triggers high above the map, which, when entered, immediately beat the boss. This greatly reduces the time required to beat each boss. Beating Prawn goes from taking roughly a minute down to around 15 seconds. Without hitting the trigger, the Flying Dutchman takes over 2.5 minutes, whereas scaling up to the trigger is only around 16 seconds. While Robo Spongebob isn't cycle based in the same way the other bosses are, hitting the trigger still takes only around 17 seconds, saving dozens of seconds. In contrast, the other three bosses don't have triggers that end the fight. Now, for King Jellyfish, this isn't a big issue. Since it's the very first boss the players are supposed to encounter, the developers didn't plan for players to fight it at the end of the game. Given this, the player is able to simply use the rocket against it and avoid normal cycles it's supposed to go through before being able to get hit. This leaves just Robo Sandy and Robo Patrick, the two most important bosses, being unskippable. The unfortunate thing is how close they are to being skipped. Located under both of their maps is a golden spatula. None of the other bosses have the spatulas loaded into the level before they are beaten. In theory, this means if the player could find a way to collect a spatula, they'd be able to skip the boss and save multiple minutes from the run. The issue with this is getting to the spatulas. Robo Sandy's is located underneath the stage. Despite being visually short, the arena's walls extend high into the air. Even if the player is able to get over them, there's no way to get through the octagon's walls. Robo Patrick's fight is even more hopeless. Rather than high walls, the arena is surrounded by an industrial park of goo. Once over the fence, the ground eventually becomes intangible, but not before the player is hopelessly far from the spatula. Even if they were to reach it, once the player grabs a spatula, they lose control of the game until the celebration animation plays. While this may not seem like a problem, the animation will not start until the player is grounded, and there's nothing down there besides the void. Although this spatula is rather hopeless, Robo Sandy's actually can be reached. One of her attacks is an elbow slam. By placing Spongebob squarely under her torso and performing a bash, her model forces Spongebob through the ground and he comes out right next to the spatula. Now, you may be wondering, if this is possible, why is it not done? Well, it comes back to the whole reason why this fight is completed in the first place, the bowl. While Spongebob may be able to collect the spatula, this does not give him the bowling move. Instead, this ability, as well as the rocket, are unlocked by the cutscene that plays after the boss is beaten. This, in essence, holds the entire speedrun hostage. In order to significantly speed up the rest of the game, it's necessary to complete the absolute slowest parts of the run, with virtually no possibility to ever speed them up. It's instances like this that contribute to the view that speedrunning is incredibly repetitive. Runners sit down to practice the same trick for hours, or grind out the beginning of a run for dozens of attempts, hoping for just one to make it to the next level. But by and large, this is a vast oversimplification for most games. After all, much like a musician playing an instrument or a basketball player shooting free throws, it takes time and dedication to improve at any skill, even if it looks tedious from the outside looking in. There are exceptions to this though. Some games truly are just the same task over and over again, with the player just hoping this attempt is faster. Brawl Stars is a mobile game released by Supercell, the creator of games like Clash of Clans and Clash Royale. Players go up against each other in either free-for-all or co-op game modes using a cast of characters with different abilities. These characters are unlocked as the player progresses, meaning they have a limited selection upon starting the game. When the player performs well enough in a game, they're rewarded with trophies. Trophies are a measure of a player's overall progress, as well as their progress with an individual character. Unlike most speedruns, Brawl Stars is a competitive multiplayer. This has a huge impact on speedrunning, as now the run is no longer in the player's control, but rather is heavily dependent on how good teammates or competitors are. For instance, in the world record for the under 5000 trophies category for the showdown game mode, the runner defeated 5 of the other 9 competitors before finishing the game in just over 27 seconds. This is dramatically different from the world record for the over 10,000 trophies category for the same game mode. There, the runner only defeated a single person, with the other 8 people eliminating each other. This includes the 2nd and 3rd place finishers who defeated one another, leaving the runner as the winner by default with a time that was nearly 2 seconds faster than under 5000 trophies. In many respects, this demonstrates the texture of speedrunning games like Brawl Stars. Rather than being solely dependent on factors within the runner's controls, or on external factors that the game controls, such as RNG, the determining factor is now a third party that is actively working against the runner's goals. For instance, in both those world records, the gameplay focuses on the center of the map. 
If one competitor decided that rather than rushing the center, they were going to remain around the edge, this would significantly hamper the speed of the run, making a good time impossible. Concurrently, with there being 9 players competing against the runner, it's very likely that they would be eliminated, ending the run. Where the speedruns become absurd though is trophy speedruns. These speedruns focus on reaching certain trophy thresholds, ranging from as low as 60 trophies all the way up to 10,000 and divided between solo and co-op runs. These different playstyles actually have a massive impact on the speed of the run. Solo and co-op play very different game modes. While solo runners compete in a single elimination, 10-way free-for-all, co-op has the option to play the same free-for-all but with 5 teams of 2, or a 3v3 soccer match where the first team to score 2 goals wins. An interesting pattern emerges between the categories as the requisite trophy count increases. At the 60 and 250 trophy levels, the solo world records are faster than co-op, but for each subsequent threshold, co-op beats it. For the 500 and 1000 trophy categories, players run as pairs of two, but for each category after this, they switch to teams of three. This illustrates a unique balancing act between the game modes. It goes without saying, but a perfect run would win every match. Inherently, the more matches someone needs to play, the less likely this is to occur. In the 60 trophy category, winning 6 games in a row is not an outrageous win streak, but as the trophy count increases, bad luck becomes more probable. By changing to teams of 2, the odds of winning each individual game doubles, making longer win streaks more likely, with this being even more so the case for 3v3s. While it may seem like playing 3v3s would always be the best option, it's more complicated than it seems. Ignoring how quickly each game mode takes on average, not all game modes are created equal when it comes to awarding trophies. At low trophy counts, a solo win rewards 10 trophies, while duos give 9 and 3v3s only give 8. These incrementally decrease until plateauing when the player reaches 1200 trophies, at which point solos give 5 trophies, duos are worth 4, and 3 for 3v3s. This is further complicated by win streaks. After winning 2 games in a row, a third win will give the player 1 additional trophy. This continues to increase until after the player has won 7 games in a row, capping them at 5 additional trophies per win. This is a massive increase in the trophies awarded, especially once the player has over 1200 trophies. It essentially makes solo wins worth double, while 3v3s nearly triple their worth. This makes it even more important to maintain a win streak, as ignoring the trophies actually lost from a match, just a single loss costs 20 trophies regaining a lost streak. This is especially costly in the highest trophy categories. The longest category with a video is 3000 trophies. Despite being only 50% more trophies than the 2000 trophy category, the world record is nearly 150% the length. The video to the 4000 trophy category is lost, but the pattern remains, with it being nearly twice as long as 3000, and almost 5 times the length of 2000. The longest verified run belongs to the 8000 trophy category though. Although the video is gone as well, speedrun.com shows that it had been divided into 7 parts and took 2 days, 2 hours, 23 minutes, and 29 seconds. As it stands, Brawl Stars is an incredibly punishing speedrun. The run features significant factors outside of the runner's control. Beyond even gameplay factors, since the game is multiplayer, it's necessary to account for queue times. This introduces a completely variable amount of time between every match which has the potential to impact how good a run is, especially in longer categories. On top of this, any mistake is compounding, making the hole that needs to be dug out even deeper. There's no right way for games to be speedrun. While some games may seem like objectively bad speedruns, everyone finds pleasure in different ways. In the end, if someone finds what they're doing enjoyable, then there's little reason to try and change their minds. Despite this though, sometimes it's easy to look at a game and determine that it hates speedrunning. If there are any games I missed that fit that description, feel free to leave it in the comments. Thank you for watching.